from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Red Hat Summit 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's exclusive coverage of Red Hat Summit 2018, live in San Francisco, California at Moscone West. I'm John Furrier, co-host of theCUBE, with John Troyer, co-founder of Tech Reckoning, advisory and community development firm. Our next two guests, Mike Peach, Vice President and General Manager of Middleware at Red Hat, and Mark Little, Vice President of Software Engineering for Middleware at Red Hat. Uh, this is the Stack Wars right here. Guys, thanks for coming back, good to see you guys again. Great to see, see you here. Too. So um, we love middleware because Dave Vellante and I and Stu always talk about like the, the, um, the real value is going to be created in the abstraction layers. You're seeing examples of that all over the place with Kubernetes containers, a lot of you know, multi-cloud conversations, workload management, all these things are happening at these really cool abstraction layers. That's obviously, you get not global, I'd say middleware, but you know, it's, it's where the action is. So I got to ask you, um, super cool that you guys have been leading in there, but the new stuff's happening. So let's just go review last year versus this year, What's different this year? New things happening within the company? We see core OS's in there, you guys got OpenShift is, 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 is humming along beautifully. What's new in the middleware group? Um, there's a few things, I'll, I'll take one and then maybe Mike can think of another while I'm speaking, but uh, when we were here uh, this time last year, we were talking about uh, functions as a service or serverless, and uh, we had a, a project of our own called Function, with a K. <clears throat> um, between then and now, um, the the developer affinity around uh, functions as a service has just grown. Uh, lots of people are now using it uh, and starting to use it in production. Uh, we did a review of what we were doing back then and looked around at other efforts that were in the market space and we decided that actually we wanted to get involved with a, with a large community of developers and try and move that in a direction that was probably beneficial for everybody but clearly for ourselves. Uh, and we've uh, decided, and we announced this publicly last year, but we're now involved with uh, a project called Apache OpenWhisk instead of Function. Uh, and OpenWhisk is a project that IBM originally kicked off. Uh, we got involved, it was tied very closely to Cloud Foundry. So one of the first things that we've been doing is making it more uh, Kubernetes native and allowing it to run on OpenShift. And in fact, um, we were making some announcements uh, this week around our uh, functions as a service based on Apache OpenWorks, but that's, that's probably one of the bigger things that, that's changed in the last 12 months. I would just add to that, that in, across the rest of the middleware portfolio, which is, as you know, a wide range of, of different technologies, different products, in our integration area, we've continued to push ahead with uh, you know, containerizing, you know, putting the, the integration technologies into containers, making it easier to, uh, to you know, basically connect the different components of applications and different applications to each other together th through different uh, integration paradigms, whether it's uh, messaging or more of a bus style. Uh, so with our uh, JBoss Fuse and our AMQ, we've got, uh, we've made great progress in, in continuing to refine how those are sort of invoked and consumed in the OpenShift environment. Uh, forthcoming uh, very shortly, in the, literally in the next uh, week or two, is our uh, integration platform as a service based on the Fuse and AMQ technologies. In addition, we've continued to charge ahead with our API management solution uh, based on the uh, technology we acquired from 3Scale uh, a couple of years ago. So that is coming along nicely, being very well adopted by our, our customers. And then further up the stack on the process automation front, so some of the uh, you know, business process management types of technologies, we've continued to uh, push ahead with containerizing, and that was you know, being higher up the stack and a little bit uh, bigger a scale of technology was a little bit more complex in uh, really setting it up uh, for the containerized world, but we've got our uh, process automation 7.0 release coming out in the next few weeks. Uh, and that includes uh, some exciting new technology around case management. So really bringing all of those traditional middleware capabilities forward into the cloud native uh, containerized environment is, is, has been, I would say, you know, the most significant focus of our efforts over the last year. 
Well, we, go ahead. Can you contextualize some of that a little bit for us? Uh, you know, the OpenShift, obviously a big topic of conversation here, the, the, you know, the new, uh, the new thing that everyone's looking at in Kubernetes. But these, lay these service layers, these layers it takes to build an app, still, still necessary. Mm. Uh, you know, JBoss, a, a piece of this stack, right, is, is uh, you know, eight, 17, 18 years old, right? So, so you know, can you contextualize it a little bit for people, you know, that thinking about, you know, okay, we've got OpenStack on the bottom, we've got OpenShift. Yeah. You know, where does the middleware and the business process, how has that had to be modernized and how are people, the Java developers, still fit into the equation? So, <clears throat> a, lot of, uh, a lot of that contextualization can actually, if we go back about four or five years, we announced an initiative called XPaaS, which was uh, to essentially take the, the rich uh, middleware suite of products and capabilities we had and decompose them into independently consumable services. Kind of like what you see when you look at AWS, you know, they got the simple queuing service, simple messaging service. We have those capabilities, but in the past they were kind of bundled together in an app server, so we worked to pull them apart and, and, and allow people to use them independently. So, you know, if you wanted transactions or you wanted security, you didn't have to consume the whole app server, you actually had these as independent services. So that was, that was XPaaS. We've continued on that road for the past few years, and a lot of those services are now available as part and parcel of, of OpenShift. And then we, to kind of get to the developer side of things, then we put language veneers on top of those, because, you know, we're a Java, uh, company, well at least middleware is, uh, but there's a lot more than Java out there. There's a lot of people who like to, to use Perl or PHP or JavaScript or you know Go. So we can pro provide you know, language specific clients for them to interact. So at the end of the day, your JavaScript developer who's using bulletproof uh, high performance messaging doesn't need to know that most of it is implemented in Java. Uh, you know, it's just a complete uh, opaque box to them in a way. So this is the trend of microservices. This granularity concept of this decomposition things that you guys are doing is to line up with what people want. Yep. Work with services directly. Absolutely, right, to, to, give, to give developers the entire spectrum of granularity so they can, they can basically architect at a, at a granularity that's appropriate for the given part of their job they're working on, right? It's not a one size fits all proposition. It's not, it's not like throw all the monoliths out and, and decompose every last workload into its finest grain possible pieces, right? I mean, there are, there are, there's a time and a place for ultra fine granularity and there's also uh, a time and a place to sort of group things together. And with the way that we're providing uh, our run times and the, the kind of the, the reference architectures and the general uh, sort, of, sort of design paradigm that we're um, kind of sort of curating and, and recommending for, uh, for our customers, it really is all about, you know, not just the right tool for the job, but the right granularity for the job. Yeah, it's really choice too. I mean, people can choose, and then based on their architecture, they can manage it the way they want from a design standpoint. All right, I got I to get your guys' opinion on something, because certainly we had a great week in um, Copenhagen last week in Denmark around KubeCon, Kubernetes Conference, Cloud Native Con, whatever it's, they're called, two things. There was a rallying cry around Kubernetes, and it really the community felt like that Linux moment or that TCP IP moment where you know, people talk about standards, but like, when we just do something, we got to get behind it, mm. and then differentiate and provide all kinds of coolness around it. Core, de facto, standard with Kubernetes is opening up all kinds of new creative uh, license for developers. It's also bringing up an accelerated growth. Istio's right around the corner, Kubeflow, a variety of other cool stuff on how software's being built. Right. So very cool rallying cry. What is the rallying cry in middleware in your world? Is there a similar impact going on and, and what is that? Yeah. Because you guys are certainly affected by this trend. This is how software will be built. It's going to be orchestrated, composed, like granularity options, all kinds of microservices. What's the rallying cry in the middleware? So I think uh, the rallying cry, um, two years ago, uh, at Summit, we announced something called uh, MicroProfile with IBM, with uh, Tommy Tribe, uh, another app server vendor, uh, uh, Payara, and a few quite large Java user groups to try and do something innovative and microservices specific with enterprise Java. Uh, it was incredibly successful, but the big elephant in the room who wasn't involved in that was Oracle, who at the time was still controlling Java EE. And a lot, of, you know, a lot of what we do is depend on Java EE. A lot of what other vendors who don't necessarily talk about it do is also 
dependent on Java E to one degree or another. Even Pivotal with Spring Boot requires a lot of core services like messaging and transactions that are defined in Java E. So two years further forward where we are today, we've been working with IBM and Oracle and others and we've actually um, moved or in the process of moving all of Java E away from the old process, uh, away from a single vendor's control into the Eclipse Foundation. And although that's going to take us a little while longer to do, we've been on that path for about four or five months. The amount of buzz and interest in the community and from companies big and small who would never have got involved in Java E in the past is immense. We're seeing new people get involved with the Eclipse Foundation and new companies get involved with the Cliff Foundation on a daily basis so that they can get in there and start to innovate in enterprise Java in a much more agile and iterative way than they could have done in the past. And I think that's kind of our rallying call because, we, like I said, we're getting lots of vendors, Pivotal's involved, Fujitsu. And the impact of this is going to be what? Uh, a lot more innovation, a lot quicker innovation, and it's not going to be at the slow speed of standards, it's yeah. going to be at the fast upstream open source innovative speed that we you know we see in the likes of uh, Kubernetes and Eclipse has got a good reputation as well. Yeah, but the other significant thing here, in addition to the to the faster innovation, is it's a way for it's a way forward for all of that existing Java expertise, right? It's a way for the, 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 some of the patterns and 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 some of the the knowledge that they have already to be applied in this new world of cloud native, right? So you're not throwing out mm. all that and having to essentially retrain, you know, double digit millions of, yeah. of developers around the world. Yeah, it's instant developer action. And plus Java is a great language. It's the bulldozer of languages. It can move, it can move a lot, does a lot of heavy lifting. Yeah. And there's a lot of developers out there. Okay, final question. I know you guys got to go. Thanks for spending the time on theCUBE. Really appreciate, certainly very relevant. Middleware is, the, is key to all the action. A lot of glue going on in that layers. What's going on at the show here for you guys? What's hot? What should people pay attention to? What should they look for? Um, I'll give my take. What's hot is any talk to do with middleware. Uh, but, <laughs> Bias. But, but kind of seriously, yeah. we, have, we do have a, a lot of good stuff going on with um, messaging and Kafka. Kafka is really hot at the moment. Um, we just released uh, our own project, which is eventually going to become a product called uh, Strimzy. Uh, integrated with OpenShift, so it's Kube native from the get-go, it's available now. Uh, we're integrating that with OpenWhisk, which we talked about earlier, and also with our own reactive async platform called Vertex. Uh, so there's a number of sessions on that, and if I get a chance, I'm hoping to sit so into real, one or real two. So real quick though, I mean, streaming is important because you talk about granularity. People are going to start streaming services with service meshes right around the corner. Yeah. The notion of streaming asynchronously is going Absolutely. to be a Absolutely, huge yeah. deal. And tapping into that stream at any point in time, and, and then pulling the plug and doing work based on that. Also, quick, real quick, Kubernetes, the, obviously the momentum's phenomenal in cloud native, but becoming a first class citizen in, in the enterprise, still some work to do. Thoughts on that real quick? Uh, it's, when you say Kubernetes native, is it coming faster? Is it, what's the, will it ever be? Or certainly I think it will be, but. It, it, I, would, I think this is the year of Kubernetes and of enterprise Kubernetes. I mean, you just look at the phenomenal growth yeah. of OpenShift and, and you know, that in yeah. a way speaks directly to, the, to this point, right? And it's, Mike, what's hot, what's hot? What are you doing at the show? What should we look at? You know, I, I'd add to, I certainly uh, would echo uh, the, the points Mark made. And in addition to that, I would take a look at any session here on API management. I, again, within middleware, the three scale technology we acquired is still going gangbusters. The customers are loving that, finding it extremely helpful as they start to navigate the, you know, the complexity of doing essentially distributed computing using containers and microservices. Getting more disciplined about API management is, is of huge relevance in that world. So that's, uh, that would be the next thing I'd add. Congratulations guys. Finally the operating system called the cloud is taking over the world. <laughs> it's basically distributed computer all connected together. It all sounds that like stuff we learned uh, in the uh, 80s, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a systems world, and the middleware is changing the game, modern software, uh, construction of, of, of applications, all being done in a new way, You're looking at orchestration, serverless, service meshes, all happening in real time. Guys, congratulations on all the work, and Red Hat, be keeping it in the open, Java E coming around the corner as well. It's theCUBE bringing it out in the open here in San Francisco. I'm John Furrier with John Troy. We'll be back with more live coverage after this short break. <laughs>